third method uh, is turn of nut. It says run the nut down, bring the parts in close contact. Good housekeeping says work from the stiffer regions to the edge. Establish snug tight. I mentioned earlier it's the full effort of a worker on a spud wrench or it's the first impact of an impact wrench. And you can hear that. It sounds different. And then you apply an additional half turn or two-thirds or one-third, depending on the length of bolt. Usually it's a half turn. For most cases, it's a half turn. Okay? There are your iron workers, and they say, gee whiz, uh, he went to this seminar and now he knows everything. That sounds really all too vague. Uh, these guys make more money than you do, so you better listen to them, satisfy their concerns. So here's the big picture again. I happen to put the data points on. Uh, so we do this installation. We do the measurements. Uh, I'm going to look at the half turn region in a minute. But uh, I just put on here by way of passing the proof load. Remember I said that was in the specification, ASTM spec. Did it mean anything? Look at this. Does it mean anything? Are conditions above the proof load and below the proof load different? No, they're not different. Plays, plays no role in what we're doing. Okay, here's the, the close-up. It doesn't happen to be the same joint. This happens to be the big joint that I used uh, early on. And uh, th those joint, the elongation of those bolts was measured and related to uh, the, pre the force in the bolt. So we have the big picture. And the big picture is this histogram you see down at the bottom. So two, one bolt is here and two bolts are here and one bolt got it and also the uh, range of the elongations that snug were measured the sequence is you measure the snug first and then you install the, then you put the half turn on and then you do the other measurements all right so we're going to get quite a good bit of good information from this let's look at the bolt elongations that half turn first there's the east least elongated bolt i better i'm not allowed to go back can I go back? Yeah. Uh, look at the uh, elongations of the snu at snug tight, please. What's the elongation there? I don't know, 15? What's the elongation here? I don't know, 38? Big difference, eh? And, and the others are all in between there. So there's a big difference in snug tight. I'm sorry I didn't do that in the right sequence. I'm doing it now. There's a big difference in what happens at snug tight. Then we go on to the next stage. We'll just accept that as information. The least elongated bolt is about 03. The most elongated bolt is about 05. Now that's a big difference. All right. The proof of all of this, what we're looking for, is the, what's the bolt pretension? What's the pretension in the bolt that's least elongated? 50 units, chips, eh? What's the pretension in the most elongated bolt? I don't know. <laughs> Pick a number, 49.8 or something. I mean, the, the reason they're the same, and this is valid over a lot of experience with testing joints and, and field measurements too, is that we deliberately ensure that the bolt is taken into the inelastic region. We have this flat portion, and that's where we expect the bolts to end up. This means that we have pretensions that are greater than we require, and they don't vary significantly one from the other. So we get the pretension force. It's a, a simple method of installation and works very well. This is the same information, but doing it in terms of rotation. Because I, I, a question that would, would logically come up, and I'm, I'm asking it on your behalf, is, uh, well, you asked him to put on half turn, but maybe he put on more. That, you know, that, that can happen. So for A325 bolts, if you look past the half turn marker, how far does it go? I don't know, nearly two turns. Eh? There's a lot of rotational uh, tolerance there. And for the A490 bolts, up to, I don't know, one and a quarter turns. In a, in a general way, but not to be treated lightly, if you install the bolt, turn on that installation, and you don't break it, it's highly likely that it's a satisfactory installation. It's unlikely that somebody comes along afterwards, you've taken it to 
one and a half turns and another quarter turn will break it, who comes along afterwards and puts on the other quarter turn? Just doesn't happen, with some exceptions. I'd be concerned about uh, bolts and towers, for example. Vandalism. Vandalism is the, is the potential problem, and it can happen when it's an exposed structure. Okay, if you think you're going to determine the bolt pretension after installation, it's just not practical. It can be done if you buy a ultrasonic bolt load indicator. It's about twenty-five dollars or $30,000, and it, it's a little time-consuming. But that's a research tool. I don't, you know, it's not a production, run-of-the-mill, daily use tool. So to think that you're going to determine the pretension after installation, I know there are some inspectors here. Uh, well, I'm not going to lay in at all inspectors. Uh, it's just about impossible. Understand the requirements. If you needed pretension bolts, fine. But if you didn't need them, even though they pretensioned them, then don't sweat it. Make sure that everything on the site is monitored. You keep things clean, proper storage, etc. Good housing, housekeeping, practical things. Uh, so we're, we're into installation. I've already said if you don't need the pretension, why inspect for it? Make sure you understand what calibration process is required and monitor it. You're on time to the inspectors now. So by any method of installation, we haven't covered all of them yet. By any method of installation you have to do a calibration. You have to do that load cell thing that I was showing just a moment ago. And you've got to be watching the work in progress. You can't come back three weeks later and do any serious inspection. It's not going to work. So here are the cases that AISC allows. First of all, bolts need to be, and then I'll tie in inspection uh, characteristics with each of them. If I need to have them snug tight only, or I need them pretension, but it's not slip critical, they have some cases where they want you to pretension them, like a connection in tension. It's not necessary for strength to pretension the bolts, as you now know, but good practice says keep those joints uh, compact. Or it is slip critical, and I have the whole ball of wax. So snug tight only, it's a bearing tight connection, as we call it. Uh, uh, we use that for bolts in tension, A325 only. When there's no fatigue or vibration present, you can use them. So the inspection in that case, make sure you got the right stuff. I know, when this comes out, people are always, the sense always is it's too simple. This is too easy. It can't be any good because it's not complicated enough. There's no way I can, I can't complicate it. It's simple. It's easy. It's straightforward. Just stay on top of things. Got the right bolts, nuts, and washers? Well, now why wouldn't I? Of course. Uh, hole types? Sometimes when you, you're having slotted holes or oversized holes, make sure they're okay. Uh, you want the contact surfaces reasonably clean. That's not an issue in terms of strength, but that's good housekeeping. So for snug tight, mainly we would see that after I snug tightened, snug tightened the bolts, are things in reason? Are they in reasonable contact? You look at it and you say, yeah, it's okay. You see some gaps, don't worry about it. As long as they're not big. That's a corrosion-related issue. We don't want, uh, uh, if it's exposed structure, it's good practice to not have uh, big gaps, so corrosion can start there. Now, if you need pretension bolts, but not slip critical, uh, then, of course, you do all of the above, which wasn't very onerous, and then you observe the verification process for the pre-installation. What does he mean? I've already told you that, but let me reinforce it. He means... Let's say it's a turn of nut installation. It means that the, cal the, um, the bolt calibrator has to be used to identify that I had to add a half turn of pass snug in that bolt load indicator that we've got the pretension. That's what's meant by pre-installation verification, and it applies to all of the methods. So it's turn of nut or calibrated wrench or the other ones, which I haven't talked about yet. Have to do it once a day, stress that, and any time conditions change, I stress that. Now, if it's slip critical, you do all of the above that we've gotten to at this point, and you look at the fang surfaces and make sure they're clean. And again, ensure that uh, the calibration process is the same as what's being done in the field. 
questions arise, can I do this calibration in the shop? Why? Well, it's not raining in the shop. They don't say that, but well, that's an implication. It's a lot more convenient, but that's not what's intended. It's intended that it's on the must be on the job site. You're, you're replicating the conditions on the job site. Here's an inspected joint. It comes back. Uh, it comes from that structure that we looked at earlier. It's big joint, eh? Uh, some of you can see, but not everybody. There. Uh, why have we got these stage lights on? Can you turn off the stage lights? Uh, and in this case, they, they match mark, they put the wrench on, made a mark. The chuck always has, uh, the socket always has uh, markings on it. So let's say it's half turn. So they put a half turn on. Uh, installers asked to put a chalk mark on there. Get the idea? Uh, that's not required by the specification. But some, fab some steel erectors, inspectors uh, do it that way but it's certainly not necessary. Good. It, no, it's a good way of keeping track, but when you, when you see a bolt that has been uh, impacted, I'll use half turn as my continuing example, uh, with an impact wrench, you can tell that it's been impacted. And the edges are peened. That's a lot of hard work for the wrench to do, and it, it shows the evidence of that when you look at the installed fastener. Oh, and by the way, uh, Let's go back to questions that discussions that we had earlier about the amount of slip. Now this is an extreme example. Keep that in mind. But how much is this joint going to slip? I don't know that it's slip critical. I'm just assuming it is. How much is this joint going to slip? Well, try pulling it to the left. Try pulling it to the right. But other, it's not going anywhere, is it? Whichever direction you apply forces, there are going to be lots of bolts already in bearing. So there's not going to be any significant slip. But uh, that's an observation that's easy to make with a joint of this magnitude, not so easy necessarily with smaller joints. Can we have pretensions greater than specified values? Yeah. No problem. Didn't break the bolt. And the specification specifically says this. It says uh, pretensions greater than those specified are not cause for rejection. Uh, rotation tests are required for galvanized A325 bolts. They're not required for any other case that I'm aware of. But they're good for any short grip bolt. With a short bolt, I don't know what, inch and a half long? Something like that. Uh, and let's say it's half turn. Uh, that would be a third turn. Uh, you, you may uh, break those bolts before you get them installed. You can pick this up more easily by a rotation test rather than finding out later in the field that you're breaking it. So it's kind of insurance. It's good insurance for uh, short grip bolts and it is required for galvanized A325 bolts. You can't galvanize A490 so that doesn't come into the picture. Now, some measured values. This is from bridges. There are three different bridges. And uh, it's a histogram again. So on the horizontal axis, we should be getting one. That's when you get the minimum. And we've got two down at 0.6, one at 0.7. You get the drift. Okay. But, uh, and there's the mean. It's 1.27. So that's okay. And 160 fasteners. So my question to myself and to you indirectly is, is this okay? But I certainly have some fasteners that did not meet what was required. It's a part of a large population. You have to, one has to answer this individually. You don't usually have this information. You happen to have it. I don't have any problem whatsoever with this. The mean value uh, is fine. The standard deviation is relatively small. Look, one standard deviation below the mean you're still at 1.07. So I think we would justify that this is a satisfactory uh, installation. But it's, it's nice to have comfort of measured values taken from the field with real installations. In fact, uh, expanding that for A325 bolts, turn of nut, first of all, the average tensile strength, which we keep citing 120, 
it's actually higher than that. The manufacturer, he can't make his bolts to 120. He has to make them to a higher value than that. So he doesn't get any rejections. So he makes them about 18% higher on average. And the average pretension force isn't 70%, it's 80%. Well, that's just the way things happen. So the, combining those two, the result is that the actual bolt pretensions, talking about one case, that's turn of nut, A325, is about 35% greater than the specified pretension. So any of those times when we said put in 70% of blah, 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 uh, we're getting quite a bit higher than that. For A490s, it's about 26%. If you calibrate, calibrated wrench, you're heading for a specific value and you don't get these benefits you get about a 13% increase. Now, it would be nice to think that if we get into difficulty, we can invoke these increases. But in fact, they're already built into the rules. Uh, so it's there. It's already been taken care of. Now, some other options for bolts. Uh, they don't all look like the ones I've been implying. Uh, tension control bolts. Their ASTM specification is 1852. Use of load indicating washers. Uh, F959, I'll explain both of those. And then there are so-called alternative designs, but uh, they don't show up in structural practice. They're in truck building and stuff like that. Here's a tension control bolt. Uh, TC bolt, is it called? And right off the bat, it looks different, doesn't it? They can have a round head or a button head like this one is shown, but they can have a conventional head also. But on the downhill side, they've got a uh, stubby end with a uh, it's a spline that extends out beyond the normal end and in that spline is a groove and the way these are installed is by putting a wrench on that captures the nut turns it in one direction captures the spline and turns it in the other direction so there's a region of more or less constant torque between those locations. And if you set things up the way you're supposed to, the way the manufacturer intends, it will twist off at the desired pretension. So that was the basis for the idea and that's what you got now in the ESDM spec. So the wrench has coaxial inner and outer uh, uh, chucks. The nuts turned in one direction, spline end goes in the other and you get shear off if it's properly calibrated at, uh, I think it's 105, 1.05 times the specified minimum also. Now, what we depend on, that twist off torsion, is the strength of the bolt material, but we don't control that. The diameter of that groove, but we don't control that. The thread friction conditions, and we sure don't control that. Uh, and the friction at the nut washer interface, which is quite significant. So all those things have to be controlled. And the manufacturer provides the lubricant. So friction conditions, which are so important, are controlled by whatever the manufacturer provides. It's not within our, as designers or users or installers or inspectors. So you can't mess with that. That's what they provide. And it's, it's proprietary. So manufacturer A uses something and manufacturer B has got a better product. And uh, like that. So you cannot relubricate those. You can't clean them. You have to use uh, them in the as-delivered condition. And you have to, of course, do a calibration for that. Uh, one thing I want to make sure you understand is that the fact that somebody comes along, where's the inspector? Who are the inspectors? Yeah. And says, well, I, I've got all these, yeah, I, I've, they're all, kits are all twisted off. Well, yeah, they are. But be a little cautious. Uh, suppose the friction conditions are very, very high. So I drop the bolt in the sand. And as soon as I started this process, remember, however we do it, we're elongating the bolt. That's how we get the pretension in the bolt. But I created artificially high friction. So it twists off right away. And I haven't elongated it very much at all. So I don't have the pretension, even though I got the tip twisted off. Somebody else comes along and says, ah, oh, I'm going to use a super duper lubricant. I'm going to add it. 
And he twists and twists and twists and never builds up the torsion that will twist off the, at the groove, that will cause twist off at the groove. Meanwhile, he's been elongating the bolt a long time since. So he got the free tension, he just didn't know it. Calibration is essential, that's what this is saying. And, and as inspectors or users, uh, make sure you understand that it's not the fact that the tips have twisted off that ensures that you have the pretension. But I'm sure the inspectors knew that. It's advantageous because the installation is only for one only from one side. You don't need a you don't need two people, you can do it with one. Uh, use an electric wrench so the equipment that you have to haul around is minimal. It's a quiet installation, has a number of advantages. Uh, generally it's more expensive and I guess a disadvantage, but it applies to all of them, is that you have to do the calibration procedure, but, but they all have to do that. So, it's fine. Load indicating washers are uh, these washers that have the bumps on them. I think you can anticipate that as the pressure is applied, this is in the system, uh, a gap will be present and then be closing. So if you calibrate the closure of the gap, they usually use a uh, it's a feeler gauge and it's usually a um, go, no go kind of operation. And so as the force is applied, those protrusions are flattened and you can relate that to the pretension. And this also is a suitable method, again, providing the calibration is procedure is properly followed. So the reliability, uh, yeah, you've got to do the calibration, but the, the reliability past that or based using that assumption, is it the, it's the same as the uh, calibrated wrench installation. And just a reminder, the torque uh, tension control bolt is torque dependent. The load indicating washer is elongation dependent. And we've talked about elongation and uh, torque. A mental pause. Uh, there's some references available for you uh, that Load, that's Research Council on Structural Connection Specification is uh, a good resource for you, particularly when you have questions of interpretation. There's a lot of commentary. It's not a big spec. There's sufficient commentary in there that you would find helpful. And there's a free download available for that. You don't have to be a member of AISC. It's free. Uh, the uh, What's called the Guide to Design Criteria for Bolted and Riveted Joints. Uh, last publication was in 1987, so it's it's not kept up to date. It's being worked on now. All the basic information up to that time, uh, and it's still fundamental, is available there. And this is a free download. That's a 300-page book that uh, used to cost 100 and some bucks, and you can get it now for free. You just don't get it on. You get it as an electronic file. And it's at the Research Council and Structural Connections website. And I've got those websites uh, listed in a minute. If you're on the mechanical engineering side, uh, an equally good reference is this one by John Bickford. So I'd recommend that to you if you're doing flange fittings, things like that. And the, uh, Steve mentioned this earlier, AISC has a, very good, has a series of very good design guides. Uh, free to members, but otherwise you have to pay for them. And all of the stuff, all of the material I've been discussing is in Design Guide 17. Uh, it's not up to date with the 2005 spec, but there aren't that many differences. So I'd recommend that to you, of course. So here are the websites. You can look at them uh, later. Uh, just pointing out that they're in your information package. And uh, uh, highly meant, recommend to you that you use AISC's website, especially their uh, frequently asked questions, which are available to anybody who's intelligent enough to find the website. You don't have to, they have a lot of stuff that's free and you should take advantage of that. And you're not the first person that ha thought they had that problem. Look in the frequently asked questions stuff. Now, what's remaining for us is some other details, which we'll go through fairly quickly. I'm going to talk about joints with both bolts and wells because it illustrates some principles that I've discussed earlier. Shear lag, seismic design, 
and then we do a design example. And uh, we've still got lots of time. So 4.30 is the advertised starting time, and if you have to be excused, that's fine. So washers, uh, standard hardened washers required when you have a torque-based method. So you have to use it for calibrated wrench and uh, TC bolts. But snug tight, you don't have to. Or turn them nuts, you don't have to. Uh, direct tension indicators, which is not torque based, but elongation based, you have to use a washer for reasons having to do with measurement of that gap. Not required, I've already mentioned that. Uh, if you have sloping surfaces, of course you have to have special washers for that. And if you're using A490 volts and steels where the yield strength is less than 40 KSI, you have to have washers because it'll uh, scour into the material. It's not very often, though, anymore that we use steels with F sub Y less than 40. In many cases where you have slotted or oversized holes, I won't enumerate those. It's a matter of being aware that sometimes you have to have washers and sometimes you have to have bar washers, too. Uh, so look at the spec and, and look at that. Slotted or oversized holes obviously can be very advantageous. You take uh, account of the slot directly when you're into the design. There's a less area than formerly, and uh, it can affect the pretension in the bolt, and I've already mentioned that. It's taken account. It's embodied in the rules. Partly because I'm going to reinforce things, I, I'm going to look at a joint with both bolts and welds. Um, we don't often see those, but sometimes it happens where you've got an existing connection particularly, and I'll illustrate this way, I don't have enough room. I've got the bolts in, I don't have enough room. It's a renovation job. So I can fly some welds in. So I fly a weld in there. That's a longitudinal fillet weld. And we'd have one on the other side and we could have a transverse weld as well. If I gave you this information, if I gave you the load deformation characteristics of the transverse weld, look at it, of the longitudinal weld, look at it, and of the bolt in shear, then you'd be able to solve this category of problem. Right now, today, you'd have to do maybe a little more thinking, but here's what's happening. I stress the idea that you look at deformations first. So apply a deformation. I'm going to go just about to the ultimate of the uh, strength of the transverse fillet weld. You know, just a little bit more to the right and it will break. Okay, there's its strength. How much load is carried by, and I can figure out the load. How much uh, load will be carried by the longitudinal weld at this point? Well, I don't know, it's 80% of that. And how much by the bolt? Well, it's 40% of that. Whatever. Given this information, you can produce the number. Uh, so you can make that calculation. And this information is not difficult to come by. It's not in your, it's not in the spec, it's not in the handbook, but it's generally available. So once you have that information, you can figure that out. 